This morning, we're going to start a new series, so if you'll turn in your Bibles to Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible, Exodus, chapter 33. And the series is going to be known as the Names of God. So we're going to look at God's different names. Please stand with me. I want to read a chapter to you. Chapter 33 of the book of Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the Termite, and the... Sorry, I kept going. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this, this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you, do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the Tabernacle of Meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord, went out to the tabern ta tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. And so it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at the his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his do tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. You have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me. You shall stand on the rock, and it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Lord, as we hear these words, there's a story here, a story that we really want to know. And we pray that you'll speak to our hearts Give us, Lord, insight into them, but more than that, put these words deep within that we might learn about you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. From the Shakespeare play, Romeo and Juliet, the great author said, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Of course, this is what Juliet argued, that a name really doesn't matter. Things are going to be as they're going to be regardless of what, the, what they're called. But consider the Bible names, those names we find in Scripture. A Bible name often carries with it a greater significance. For instance, the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Or, you shall call his name Jesus, 
for he shall save his people from their sins. And that name Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. I'd say that is a significant uh, name and one that uh, deserves a second look because there's often something in a name. But what's really in a name? We have a saying. He's made a real name for himself. You heard that before. It means that he's done well for himself. He's, he's developed a good name, a good reputation. Or we'll say the opposite, that he has a bad name in this town. What does that mean? His name is his name. It's not his name, but it's his reputation. His reputation is bad. So to make a name for yourself means that you've built up a reputation. You've come to be known as something or someone, whether it's good or whether it's bad. To make a name for yourself means that that's how people relate to you. That's how they, they understand you. That's what people think of you because of your name. Thomas Edison, for instance. Babe Ruth. Or how about Bill Gates? Richard Nixon. Ronald Reagan. Bill Clinton, Vince Lombardi, Betty Crocker, one of my faves. But all of these names conjure up certain thoughts, ideas, images, and even most importantly in light of what I'm saying here, a distinct reputation. They have a reputation. And that's why names are more important than we might think, and that's why it's important that we pay close attention to the different names that God ascribes to himself in the Scripture. Because whenever he declared a different name, it was in order to reveal another side to himself, another side of his personality, or even to describe to us a nature that is previously hidden, something that we didn't know about him. In other words, God ascribes different names to himself because he wants to tell us how he wants us to know him, how he wants to be known. And the more that we understand these various meanings of his names, well, the better that we're going to be able to understand him. In fact, the more we understand him, the more we will fall in love with him as we study these various names of God. And our goal, of course, is to know him better. Now, the scripture I've chosen, of course, to begin this series is this beautiful passage of Scripture in Exodus 33. But in Exodus chapter 32, it sort of sets the scene. As Moses was up on, the, on Mount Sinai, and there he was uh, receiving the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Now he was there a very long time. And the children of Israel figured that something bad had happened to him, and maybe he was dead. And so they sort of came up with a brilliant idea. Hey, I know, they said, what do you say we make a golden calf? and we'll dance around it naked, and we'll worship it. What do you guys think? What a great idea. It wasn't a great idea. Well, while Moses was up on the mountain, the Lord said, you better get down there, Moses, because your people are getting down, and you're not going to like it. And so Moses returned from Sinai, and when he got there, he saw what the people were doing, and it was an atrocity. It was terrible. And so he became angry. And he took the tablets of the Ten Commandments and threw them down at the people, and they shattered on the ground, making Moses, of course, the first and only man to break all Ten Commandments with one single act. Nonetheless, God had a plan, and his plan was to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, and Moses was his man for the job. And so in the opening verses of chapter 33, the Lord said, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. In other words, this is the land I promised you, I want you to take your people and go. But this was really more, of a, more or less a test for Moses, a test of his loyalty, a test of his faithfulness, and a test of his love for God. See, Moses enjoyed a very special relationship with the Lord. No one had a relationship such as Moses' relationship with God. And so this was about to be a test for this great man of faith. Moses met with God and, and spoke with him in the most intimate ways, and he had conversations with God. In fact, verse 11, as I've already read, tells us that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Imagine, imagine such an intimate relationship. 
hey, God, what do you think? And God would say, well, you know what I think, Moses? And there was this intimacy that went on between them. And Moses so enjoyed this intimacy that he even made himself his own makeshift church. And he called it the tabernacle of meeting, as verse 7 tells us. It tells us that whoever wanted to seek the Lord could actually go there and meet with the Lord if they wanted to. But Moses is the one who seemed to have taken advantage of this more often. And every time he went into this tabernacle of meeting, it must have been quite a sight, every time he would go in there, at least the story tells us, in verse 8 he said, it says, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, all the people rose. Each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, the pillar of cloud, or God's presence, appeared there and descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And that must have been quite a sight. And this happened every time Moses went into the tabernacle to meet with God. Thus he called it the tabernacle of meeting. I imagine that all eyes were constantly on Moses at all times. I could see him waking up in the mornings, rubbing the sleep from his eyes, and starting that walk out to the camp or out to the tent, the tabernacle of meeting, as we said, as it said in this text here, that he put it far from the camp outside, so that was quite a walk. And starting to walk that long walk, he'd head toward the tabernacle of meeting. He'd stop at the Wawa along the way, but he'd get there nonetheless. Then the neighbors would start to talk. He's on the move. Moses is on his way to the tent, and everyone stood up. You know, they, that would spread like wildfire through a camp. They were all living in tents. That's all it was, lean-tos and tents. You have telegraph and telephone and telecommunication. This was tell your neighbor. And they would all say, Moses is going. He's going out to the tent. And as soon as Moses would enter that tent, he would shut the flap behind him, and that cloud would appear announcing to everyone anywhere near that place that God was there. God was there. Tabernacle of meeting. Who did they meet with? They met with God. And the cloud of God's presence stood guard over the tent while Moses was in it. In fact, the the cloud of God's presence actually stood guard over the entire camp. And it makes you wonder, why in the world did they decide to make a golden calf? What were they thinking when they had the living God hanging in the hood? What were they thinking? It's craziness. Moses was meeting with God on this day, but there was a lot riding on this particular meeting. In fact, God was pretty angry. He was very angry with the people because they were so fickle and so unfaithful. They just made a promise. God is our God. We're going to follow God. But then they went out and made an idol of gold and worshipped it. And God wasn't happy. How could you turn so quickly? We see in verses 3 and 5, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. In verse 5, For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people, I could come into your midst in one moment and consume you. Ooh, I'm so mad at you. I could step in your camp right now and boom, you're all gone. That's how mad I am with you. Go, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Now, we don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear that about God. God doesn't get mad like that. Well, read it right here. What is that saying? He was upset. In chapter 32, in verse 8, we see exactly how upset he was and why. It says in verse 8, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. How crazy is that? It wasn't the golden calf. You just made the calf. After you came out of Egypt, it was God that pulled you out of Egypt. What are you talking about? What are you thinking? And the Lord said to Moses in verse 9 of chapter 32, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. 
Now therefore, let me alone, or leave me be, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. This, was the, this is where the test comes in. God offered Moses a great deal here. He really wanted to destroy the entire nation, nearly two million people. And Moses, I'll just start over with you. What do you say? This is the test. What would Moses do? What would he do? What is going on in Moses' heart? What is really in his mind? Was he going to jump at this opportunity? Would he accept God's offer? Yes, Lord, of course. These people are terrible. I've never seen people so bad. They've been a pain in our necks ever since you stuck them with me in Egypt. I don't like them. Who needs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob anyway? Wipe them out and start over and give me the kingdom. But Moses didn't say that at all. Wasn't even, not even for a second in his heart. Instead, he prayed for them. He interceded on their behalf. And in verse 31, it says, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a golden calf. There's no question. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. I don't want to live if I can't live with them. Moses passed the test. At least this test. There'd be more. In the next test, Moses received details about their new home, their new homeland. Moses, I want you to take these people to the promised land. It's a good land. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be a great place for you folks. It's a step up from what you're used to. The wilderness versus the promised land. And in verse 14, the Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses responded a bit oddly in verse 15. He said, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't bring us up from here either. In other words, if you're not going, neither are we. And that should really be our attitude as well. That's the attitude. If God's not in this, I don't want to be there either. Boy, I'll tell you, we could sure benefit with that kind of thinking. Remember at this point, the verdict is still out. And the last thing that Moses heard was that you are a stiff-necked people, and I want to come up in your midst in one moment and consume you. Therefore, take off your garments or your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. In other words, God issued a temporary stay of execution, but not because he needed to think or wasn't sure about what he was going to do to these people. I think it was more that he wanted them to think and to give them an opportunity to repent and to turn from their ways, as God is always gracious to give people an opportunity to repent. He gives space. He's slow to anger, patient. So Moses thought, well, listen, if you're going to decide to kill us, well, then maybe you should do it here. Why make us wander through the wilderness if you're only going to kill us? Do it here. Do it now. But we don't want to go anywhere without you. And then in verse 17, the Lord said, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for I have found grace in your sight, and I know you by name. I know your reputation. I know what you're about, Moses. I know you better than you know yourself. And I've decided to forgive you. I've decided not to kill you because I love you. And I want to save you. He said, Moses, I know you by name. Very odd statement, I think. Of course, God knows Moses' name. But he knows all of our names. So what does he really mean? And this is really at the heart of the sermon that I'm bringing today. What's in a name? What's in a name is, is knowledge. It's, it's, it's reputation and relationship. When you know what someone stands for, you can, you can choose to know them or to stay away from them, given by what is in their name. God can't really use a person who hasn't had time with him, to know him. So it's as if he said, Moses, this whole experience has been a test for you. 
And now I know you. I know what's in your heart. I know that you have a heart for me. And I know that you're a good man. You have a good character. That you genuinely care for people as I would care for people. So I've chosen you for this special task you've passed. And Moses was given a very special privilege and a very unique relationship with God. And I think that Moses knew this. And I think that's why he spent so much time at the tabernacle of meeting. Because it was in Moses' heart to know the Lord, to know God better and deeper than, and that, than anyone ever could. That was in his name. Or that was in Moses' reputation. He was a man after God. A man with God in his heart. And with that in mind, how much time do you spend in your tabernacle of meeting with the Lord? How well do you know the Lord? I think we can liken this story and this experience of Moses to the time that we spend with God in our time with Him, in our devotions, in a devotion time, when we draw closer to God, when we get to know Him and where He gets to know us. A tabernacle of meeting, as it were, is a place to draw closer and nearer to God. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And that's what this study is really about. This whole series is about drawing closer to God. And if you don't want to draw closer to God, you're probably not going to enjoy this. But I would hope that every child of God wants to draw closer to God. That every child of God wants to know him better. And we're, we're doing that. Every time we come into His Word, every time we, we understand His name fuller and, and, and deeper. And you take note of Moses' request in verse 18. Please show me your glory. Here is this man who knew God already better than anyone else had. He spent more personal time in God's presence than anyone in the camp, than any other human being had ever had. This is such a special relationship. He was able to speak with God as with a friend. In verse 9, it says, Moses entered the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. How cool is that? In verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And I have to say, I'm a bit envious of that, as I'm sure you would be too. Wouldn't it be wonderful to step into a tent, close the door behind you, and poof, there's the presence of God? I would love to see that. Of course, it's not exactly what the English is talking about necessarily, the word face-to-face -face here, uh, speaking face-to-face, -face, is more of, a, of, of an idiom, a Hebrew uh, phrase, a cultural expression. It literally means, in the language, mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, or in other words, there was no distance between them. And whenever Moses met with God in the tabernacle of meeting, there was this immediate sense of the presence of God. They were that close, and they were able to speak. You know, when we pray, we talk to God, it seems there are delays in our answers. Moses had immediate answers. But Moses actually had to get up out of his bed, wipe the sleep from his eyes, and walk over to the tent. We don't have to do that, because we're even closer than that. We are tabernacles. We are the dwelling place of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God is within us. We're a whole different relationship now. But Moses enjoyed a special relationship. Yet notice what he asks for. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. What is he asking for? More. I want more. I'm thankful, and Moses, through the story of Moses and God, he saw the glory of God, but yet he says, I want more. I want to see more of your glory. And that's exactly what the child of God should want. That should be our attitude, that we want more. Give us more, Lord. Give us a heart like this man who longs for more. I don't want to settle for what I had last year. I don't want to settle for what I had yesterday. I want more today. I want to see you fresh. I want to see your glory today. And that is the key, I think, to personal revival in a person's life. It's the key to a, to, and the secret to a vibrant Christian life. Worldliness is when we pursue or strive for more stuff, which can only clutter a relationship to God. But godliness is when we want more of God. I want more of Him. And God's answer to his request was immediate. In verse 19, God said, tell you what I'm going to do, Mo. 
here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you, and I'm going to proclaim the name. I'm going to let you know what's in my name. This is what it means. I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And he's saying, Moses, I'm going to let you in on this because I want to. I'm going to show you this because I have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He said in verse 20, but you can't see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Wow. I can't show you my face. That would be deadly. He wanted to show him his face. I'm sure he would have loved that, but that would have been too much for him. In fact, it would have killed him. Verse 20, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So, well, this is a dilemma. How do we resolve this problem? Well, verse 21 gives us God's solution to this very dangerous situation. Moses' request is very simple. I want to see all of you. All I've seen up to this point is these glows, this Shekinah, it's beautiful. I've never seen anything like it, but I sure want more. I want a lot more than what you're showing me. Can I see your form? Let me see your face. <coughs> Let me see you, your, your, your body. Let me touch you. Let me hold you. You know, we say this in our minds. We say, I want to crawl up in your arms and let you hold me. God said, oh, Moses, I wish I could do that, but you see, there's a problem. I can't do that. So he says in verse 21, there's a place by me, and you shall stand on that rock, and so it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand and pass by, as I pass by, and then I will take away my hand and you're going to see my back, my behind. That's what he's saying. You're going to see my backside, but my face I can't let you see. Shall not be seen. Now, the spiritual imagery that's presented here is really spectacular. I I hope that I can explain it properly. I, I know we're running out of time, but what a beautiful picture this is. As God certainly wants to have this type of intimate fellowship with each one of us. In fact, I believe he created us for that purpose, that we could have fellowship with him. But his glory makes that impossible. His glory makes it impossible because we're just too sinful. It's not that God wants to hurt us in some way, not that he intentionally wants to turn us away. It's not that he hates us at all. It's just quite the opposite. He's just too holy and too pure. And that's what this glory represents. His his holiness and purity is manifested through his glory and this, this brilliant and vibrant light. And that brilliance is deadly to sinful human beings. Now, you know how I feel about Hollywood. Hollywood is terrible. I hate using their work at any time as an ideal for spiritual goodness and truth or any kind of example. I don't do it very often. But do you remember the first Indiana Jones movie? You remember that one, The Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's probably still my favorite one. But there was that scene, you know, after they've captured the ark and they were going to take it to this secluded place and take the, the lid off of the ark, remember, and see what they discover. And it was, there was that moment as they were tied to the posts and Indiana turns to his girlfriend and he says, don't look at it, don't look at it, Marion, don't look at it. And they turned their heads away, you remember? And out of the ark uh, came this, this fire. They tried to open it. This, this fire came out and consumed all of the bad guys. That was cool. Or hot. But terribly inaccurate, biblically. But it's a cool visual, and it's, it's the basic idea in that if God's face were ever to be fully exposed, anything or anyone imperfect standing before God's face would immediately be consumed by his presence in an instant. Now, here's the beauty of this. In John chapter 1, we're told in verse 17, 
For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. In other words, Jesus is the safe version of the Father. He's the safe revelation of God. Paul the Apostle, trying to give us understanding about the rock that God wanted to put Moses in, listen to this, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. The rock is Christ. God needed to protect Moses from the full force of God's glory, and so he placed him into the rock, or if you will, into Christ. And Jesus is that rock. Jesus is the one who protected Moses in the same way that he protects us. Remember the song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Protection. Jesus is the spiritual filter that enables us to see God. He filters out our sins while at the same time shielding us from God's manifested glory. And so the point is that we can only meet God through Jesus Christ so long as we are in this rock. There is no other way that we can meet God, and that's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. That's because because no man could approach God apart from Jesus, and if they could try, which they cannot, but if they could, they would be destroyed, consumed by the brightness of God's glory because of sin. But our sins are hidden in the rock. Our sins are taken away through him. Now as we enter Exodus 34, we can see what God actually did. And I love this story. It's a perfect story. In the first verse, the Lord said to Moses, I want you to cut two tablets of stone like the first ones which you broke. I added that. (laughs) And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Those are God's words. So be ready in the morning. Come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and and present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed uh, feed before that mountain. Verse 4, so he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, which he broke. Then Moses rose early in the morning, went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone to replace the ones which he broke. God's not bitter. I am, I guess. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This is what he'd been waiting for. This is what Moses asked for. This is what he wanted when he said, show me your glory. God said, okay, I'll show you. And he placed him there in the rock and he put his hand over the top of the opening, the cleft of the rock, and he put his hand over there. How many of you right now are thinking you want to peel the hand away? Wouldn't it be worth dying for? Wouldn't it be worth dying for to be able to see as you pull up his fingers, you know? Can you see? Oof! Gone. Please show me your glory. The heart of every child of God. The heart of the one who wants to know him. What is God all about? More than that, it's, it's the way God wants to be known by us. This is who I am, Moses. You know, we often have such a bad image of God, a wrong image of God, but this is how God describes himself, and this is how he wants us to know him. Here it is. Verse 6, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, I am Yahweh. That's what the name Lord, you see the capital Lord there. That's the name Yahweh. I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh God. I am merciful and gracious, long-suffering, 
I abound in goodness and truth. This is our God. This is who He is. And if we don't see Him this way, or if we see Him differently, then we have a wrong image of Him. How could a God of love dot, dot, dot? We've got the wrong understanding. Whenever we start a sentence that way, we're in the wrong place completely. Completely in the wrong place. We don't get to judge God in any way like that. No way. How could a God of love should, should stop us in our tracks and say, oh God, I'm so sorry I've judged you. He is mercy. He is grace. He's patient, good, and true. All of these and more. In verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You remember a few weeks ago when we did that, that study on sin? We talked about all three of those. They're all three here, and he's, he's there ready to forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation, meaning there's a consequence for sin, no question. But verse 7 is really a, a salvation verse, especially when he says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty. How is that possible? What do you mean you're going you're gonna to forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet hold the sinner guilty? How is that possible? You can't do both, it seems. How does he do it? The cross. Only the cross. There at Calvary is where mercy kissed justice and salvation was secured as jesus took our sins to himself and received our punishment in our place and as a result we've been forgiven and the wrath of god was satisfied in the punishment of jesus christ john himself said this in first john 2 2 he himself speaking of jesus is the sacrifice that atones for our sins and not only our sins but the sins of all the world all the world all the world. So Moses made haste, it says in verse 8, and bowed his head toward the earth, toward the earth and worshipped. Because to know him is to worship him. Jesus said the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, understanding, the knowledge of who he is. Remember in that same passage in John chapter 4, he was talking to the Samaritan woman. He talked about not knowing what they were worshiping, and that is, that is really a, a guilt that many of us hold. We don't really know who it is that we're worshiping. But Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for such who will worship him in that way. That's what he's looking for. Moses was one of the first. Let me show you who I am, Moses. And now you can worship me. And now that he saw God, he fell on his face and worshiped the Lord. Well, there can't be spiritual worship without truth and understanding and knowing who our God is. Now, if you want to be on fire for the Lord, then, then let this be your heart's prayer as well. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show me more of you. Lead me in truth and knowledge and understanding of who you are. What's in a name? I'll tell you, it's plenty. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. Yahweh is salvation. And that's why we fall before him and worship him alone. As we go through this series, we're going to learn more about our God and who he is. And I hope it will translate into pure, spiritual, truthful worship. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow our hearts to you today, we want to we know you. We want to know you. And, and right as you're seated, right where you are right now, is that the prayer of your heart? God, I want to know you. Christian, non-Christian, Christian, especially in this time. This is the secret to personal revival. Oh God, I want to know you more. Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you in, in a fresh revelation of yourself. Please let me see your glory. I want to know you, Lord. Worship you in spirit and in truth. Today, Lord, we, 
We fall before you in, in submission and humility. We see the, that our sins have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Spirit, fall upon this place. Lift the burden of guilt. Wash us by the blood of Jesus. Let us sense your presence right here in this tabernacle of meeting. We need you, Lord. We want to know you. Is that your heart's prayer? Is that your prayer? Then in your heart, tell him so. The world has, has distracted you from his beauty. Right now, confess it to the Lord. I want to lose all of the, the vision of this world. As so we turn our eyes upon the Lord, look full in his wonderful face, all the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, we want to see you today. In Jesus' name, amen.